What advice do you have for someone new to carnivore that has meat aversion? Meat never sounds and never tastes good. Let's just all give our best quick tip for meat aversion. Uh, you know, sometimes if, if you're, what I always feel is that if, you're, if your body's telling you not to eat meat, it's probably telling you just not to eat in general. You don't have to eat garbage just because you don't want to eat meat. I've, I've experienced meat aversion where my body, I, you know, even though I've been working out and, and lifting weights and playing back playing rugby, uh, everything in me was telling me, don't eat a steak. This, that sounds awful. I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. I love steak. It's my favorite thing. And it just said, no, don't do it. And I cooked it anyway, and I tried to eat it, and it just really didn't taste good. And, and so I just stopped. I just listened to my body. And I didn't think, like, well, I need to go eat something, so I'll go eat a bag of potato chips. I just didn't eat anything. And I was very nervous about that at first. And the next day, I felt great. And, uh, and the, the aversion was gone, and steak tasted great again. So I think that, you know, given a reasonable amount of time if you just you know, if you if your body's telling you to do that maybe it's telling you to fast and you're just like we have like a flu or something like that and you just sort of lose your appetite you know, it could be something that your body's telling you to just uh, avoid eating but I, I wouldn't think that you'd still want to eat garbage uh, just because you're not eating meat go ahead dante you know, it may also depend on how you're cooking it. I know a lot of people go to YouTube to look for ideas on how to cook their steak. And many of the channels that I see talking about cooking steak talk about marinades and they talk about putting a whole bunch of things in there that are not the meat. I was, before I started a carnivore way of eating, every time I would eat a steak, if it was uh, done with a marinade or it had a whole bunch of other vegetable stuff in it, I always thought this tastes awful. I like eating meat, but this doesn't taste good. And the people who were giving it to me were trying to tell me how everybody loves their marinade and how great it was. When I went to only cooking with salt, that was the first time where I was like, man, this tastes fantastic. So it could be a big part of how you're cooking it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Yeah, you could just be a bad cook. Yeah, that's something to consider. <laughs> or you could just not cook at all and eat it raw. Yes. Yeah. I actually eat a lot of raw sashimi. That gave me a lot of good variety, especially when I was a little tired of just cooked meat. So sashimi, the cold, refreshing taste, the texture is so good. I recommend going to your local Korean market, Japanese market. They have the sashimi sliced for you in the refrigerated section. It's it's uh, delicious. Let's go to Ovidia. Yeah, just uh, I would say take advantage of the large variety of animal protein sources that we have on this planet. You know, all the different uh, ruminants, non-ruminants, seafood, uh, and different preparations. And, you know, go to one of the carnivore cookbooks or carnivore cooking channels. You can get lots of great ideas to get some variety and you'll probably overcome it with time. Baker? I don't believe in meat aversion. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, obviously, if you're not familiar with it and you're used to eating overcooked, um, you know, poor quality meat, then it's going to obviously get into that. I mean, it takes, a t it takes a period of time to figure out what you like. And, you know, like I said, it doesn't mean you have to go from zero to 60 over overnight. It might be that you have to slowly transition into carnivore and you just gradually increase the amount of, you, of meat you eat with along with other foods for a while until you uh, uh, are able to uh, start to find something you like. And it may take quite a bit of experimentation. You know, some people, uh, not it's hard to believe, but not everybody wants a ribeye steak. And so some people will find success with the literally thousands of, of options that are out there. Repeat after me. I love meat. I love meat. And lines that don't eat meat become meat. But it takes time to figure out where you want to go in the, the meat world. But as uh, Dr. Avadi said, there are many, many choices out there. I love uh, tartare. Uh, raw is the best. Put an egg on it. Amazing. Just the yolk and a little bit of salt. Perfect. But I love meat. I love meat. I love meat. Uh, my wife had a meat aversion. She just hit 70 days on carnivore uh, after falling off the first time because of a meat aversion. And what worked for her is Dr. Ovadia's advice. She tried different cuts of meat. She seems to do just fine with ground beef or burger patties or slow cooked meat, but she's not quite ready for steaks yet. My sister did the same thing. She just hit one year on carnivore. 
It took her a couple months, and then one day she called me, and she's like, all of a sudden, I just have this craving for fatty ribeye. So eventually, it does come around. I love Dr. Kiltz <laughs> <laughs> and meat. Uh, so this is all great advice that uh, we've heard so far. And I can speak from my experience where meat aversion happened for me when I had to lose weight, actually. Um, and once I actually you know, got down to my target weight or close to it, uh, I didn't really have any, any sort of meat aversion anymore, so I love meat. <laughs> I Every time I get meat aversion, well, I don't anymore because I fast. I, I eat for seven days, and then I fast for seven days. And fasting for seven days makes me really love meat. <laughs> so <laughs> I think fasting is the ultimate. Sauce. Yeah, fasting is the ultimate cure for being picky. So that's what I find works the best for me. Yeah, I often get steak aversion, so I like to slow cook my meat. So I roast it first and throw it in the slow cooker, throw in lots of water and make it really soupy. And it's just that texture difference makes it's a big difference. Okay, our next super chat is from All Freedom for Dr. Kiltz. Are there any baby formulas that do not contain oil? Mother's breast milk. That's really it. And you can actually get donated breast milk. And that's what you should be looking at. Because um, the baby formulas um, are not the way to go, in my opinion. There may be some out there. I have not seen them yet. But I would try to find donated breast milk if you can't make it on your own. Um, I actually, I actually just looked, in, looked into this recently um, because I had... Uh, uh, a friend of mine who's, uh, they, they had a baby and uh, mother's milk just didn't come in. And so um, they were looking at that. So they're getting donation milk. Um, and then they found other people that were willing to donate and, you know, had extra milk and things like that. We're going to give it free. They were a bit nervous about that just because they didn't know about their you know, Pepsi and all these other sorts of things. And, you know, are you, are you, you know, didn't know if they, they, took different medications and substances and all these sorts of things. So they were a bit concerned about that. We looked long and hard. We really couldn't find any formulas that didn't have uh, seed oils, certainly not in America. I think there's some sort of law that says they have to put these stupid things in there to get this certain requisite amounts of omega-6s, and they want the linoleic acid, apparently, not uh, arachidonic acid, which is the animal source omega-6. So not in America. Uh, we looked in Australia. We looked in New Zealand. Uh, we found some goat's milk based uh, formulas, but they, they all had like palm oil and things like that in it as well. So you can find ones that are better. They're typically outside of the US, um, but no, I haven't, I haven't found any that uh, don't have them. So it might be something for, for the entrepreneurs out there to think about um, making something like that a better option because there are people looking for it. But you know, I agree with you know, Dr. Kiltz that um, you, can, you can actually often find people that are willing to donate donate milk um, and uh, you know you obviously you know, want to have a good idea of what what the mother's eating and, and uh, if they're on medications and all these sorts of things and if there's any sort of communicable illnesses that they can you know they can translate through the, the breast milk but yeah it's, it's difficult let me just add one thing to that and I certainly I agree with the breast milk is clearly best uh, interestingly this is an aside but it's an interesting study there was a study out there looking at uh, babies fed breast milk versus uh, formula, and they felt that the babies that had breast milk actually show, saw their total cholesterol go up significantly more than the, for, than the baby formula at th by 13 weeks, which is kind of interesting that breast milk causes cholesterol to go up, which kind of makes you wonder, if, is breast milk bad for us, which clearly it's not. There is, on the Weston A. Price Foundation, does have a homemade formula using goat's milk to 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 substitute for that so again go, goat's milk is probably the the best non-human milk i think that's out there i'm not a specialist in this, but that does that formula does exist and they they have a way to make that so that might be of interest tpn or looking at lipids which if you look at uh, the fish oil lipids which contains uh, egg proteins and fish oil might be something to look at that's, I haven't heard of anyone using it for that, but something interesting. Okay, this is from David. 
Thank you for your second super chat. I'm sorry, guys. We are now over 4,000 people watching the live stream. And we all want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. We really mean it. Um, I know each and every one of these carnivores here, they appreciate your support every single day. I know I do. So all of the super chats are literally in line in front of my screen. I'm just going through each one and we're trying to do our best answering all of your questions. So thank you so much for being patient. Okay, David. Bride started carnivore in March. Oh, congrats. LDL was 130, two months later, 220. Told not to panic, but it's hard not to when traditional doctors are. Note, she was malnourished and underweight to start. Thoughts, Dr. Ovedia? Um, so again, like I said earlier, lipid quality, not lipid quantity. Uh, you know, someone like this, if we have reason to be concerned, you know, you can get an advanced lipid panel. You can look at particle sizes. Um, depending on age, you might want to get a coronary artery calcium scan. Um, and... Um, but ultimately, if everything else is getting better and she's feeling better and her overall health seems to be improving, I wouldn't be getting hung up on one particular number on a blood panel. Yeah, I'll just add, you mentioned she was, she was sounded like quite thin and malnourished. Uh, according to uh, Adrian Sotomoto's meta-analysis of 41 RCTs, Looking at what drives up LDL cholesterol in a low-carb setting, low BMI is the most common thing to do that. So BMI below 25 was associated with significant increases in LDL cholesterol. Class 2 obesity or BMI above 35 often associated reduced LDL cholesterol. And again, it's like Phil says, it's conditional. I think it's a dependent variable. So it's something you shouldn't ignore, but you should get more information. And I think that's the, probably the most... Based on what we know now, that's probably the most prudent advice. It's early substantiated with experimental data or even uh, observational data, long-term observational data. And, and so just that, that best guess at the time when people doing the best that they could at the time with the information they had available, that they that, that stuck around. And then we just repeat these things ad nauseum and we just, well, everyone knows this. Everyone knows that more protein makes your, makes your kidneys get damaged and yet when people do the studies they find that kidney function actually tends to improve.